Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Tom McDermott, and welcome to this morning's uh, webinar. Um, this morning, we are delighted to co-host this event with the Electrical Division of Engineers Ireland. Um, I am the project manager, uh, the chairman for the Project Manager Society for Engineers Ireland. We have a great interest in this morning's webinar with a slightly different approach with a roundtable discussion. Today, we will discuss decarbonisation and the operation of Ireland's evolving smart grid and the role played by data centres. This will be a very balanced discussion, so I hope you enjoy the panellists and our moderator, Gary, Gary Connolly. Um, just a bit of housekeeping, please. Uh, questions for the panel should be entered in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen and not in the chat function, please. And we'll, Gary will try and get to those um, towards the end of, of our um, webinar. So I'm going to hand you over to our moderator, Gary Connolly. Gary is the founder of Host in Ireland. Host in Ireland is a strategic global interactive create, uh, initiative created to increase awareness of benefits of hosting digital assets in Ireland. And Irish companies deliver an international data center of projects. A self-proclaimed stubborn digital optimist. I think that's that's Gary. Um, Gary is a much sought after key speaker, panelist and moderator at global industry events. So Gary, without further ado, uh, if you're uh, happy to take it over from here and introduce the panelist, that'd be great. Sure. And uh, Thank you. First, sure. You can hear me OK? Yes, great. Great. Thank you, Thomas. Um, also, Sinead in the background for all the assistance on the technical side and also for Keen, who initiated the discussion. Yes, what we're going to try and do this morning between now and nine o'clock is talk openly and discuss in a, a um, conversational style. Um, Ireland, the grid, society um, and our decarbonisation strategy between now and 2030, including uh, the role that data centres have and what data centers are. Because one of the great um, challenges that we have um, when we look at the asset class called a data center is probably the lack of knowledge on actually what it is, what it does, how it works. And I think through the panelists and the discussions that we're gonna have, what we're trying to do is actually get everybody talking a language that we understand. Why do I have this picture here? Is because this young child tried, tried to tell her parents that she wanted to be a transformer for um, Halloween. I'm really not sure that's the type of transformer she was thinking of, but you get the gist. We can use words that we think we understand, but the other party interprets as something else. So this is great opportunity for us, people who work in and on the data and electrical industry, and obviously Peter who works on the more general electrical side. This is a great opportunity for us to communicate. We've put together, um, we don't have a gender balance, unfortunately, on the, the, the uh, uh, panel, but we do have a, a bald and a non-bald half and half. So we've got a nice blend of people who have hair and those that don't. But genuinely what we've got is we've got in-industry people, we've got on-industry people, we've got people who work as an operator, we've got people who design and commission data centers. And we've also then got an opportunity to, to go back and understand, as I said earlier, what data centers do, how they operate, etc. So we're gonna talk a lot this morning and we're gonna use reference to different documents, different frameworks. Um, and it's important uh, that we just lead in by saying, there's a number of documents that have been published over the last three weeks in Ireland for the Irish, for society, that basically are our roadmap between now and 2030. They're interwoven. They must be connected. There can't be multiple plans. The Climate Action Plan is the, is the key fulcrum uh, document. Um, when we get a bit more granular, the grid, which is going to have to do the heavy lifting of the decarbonisation of Irish society for transport, for home heating, for industry, for buildings, also has its own roadmap called Shaping Our Electrical Future. We'll be speaking about that also. And only on Tuesday, the specifics with regard to how going forward we're going to approach the asset class called data centers and how that will basically be connected, how you will be able to get a connection and how that ultimately we need to feed into those previous two documents. So where are we? 
It's very important before we get too deep and too narrow into the asset class of data centers, I just want to try and give you some context as to as a society where we are with regard to our decarbonization, the good bits, the not so good bits, the champions, the lack of champions. So when you look at the Environmental Protection Agency's 2020 numbers, there is effectively 57.7 million tonnes of carbon emitted by Ireland, Ireland Inc. And there you have the distribution of where that's responsibility. When we talk about data centres, I have put my glasses on here to put that. Yeah. When we talk about data centres, we're talking about a percentage of here, the energy side of things. And at the moment, we've got an 11% of that is allocated to data centers. So 11% of 15 is 1.65% is allocated to the asset class of data centers. So that's a number we should keep in our mind when we're looking at other industry sectors, because sometimes you feel that it's maybe, maybe data centers are this. <laughs> that's what it feels like sometimes when you read the press and you read all the stuff that's going on. What we're talking about is a percentage of the energy industries carbon emissions. It's been lost somehow over the, the difficult, challenging period that we've been through, and also the narrative that is uh, uh, reasonably negative towards Ireland and our carbon uh, achievements. Somewhere along the line, we've lost the fact that there has been one shining light aspect of our decarbonization. The only target that was met, as we know, published by the EPA was the decarbonization of electricity. Um, it's hard for that industry when they, when they read a lot about sort of the, the challenges that they will face and rightly so. But I think it's important to acknowledge that whilst we missed nearly all our other targets, the decarbonization of the electrical grid whilst increasing the demand has, has happened. We got to 40%, not only did we get to 40%, we got to 43%. And it's a wonderful way to lead then into Peter Connolly, because Peter, how is that missed? You know, and any other, I read a lot in the international press where the Danish, who are up on a very high pedestal for their societal decarbonization, have the Irish electrical grid up on a pedestal saying, what an achievement for a, an island to get to a, a such a high density of renewable energy. Um, can you just talk to us a bit more about the grid, where it's been, where it's come from, and set the scene then for sort of the challenges ahead? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Gary, for the, for the invitation uh, to come and, come and talk um, to a, a great society I'm a member of. So yeah, it's nice to, nice to come and talk here. Um, yeah, I, it's, it, it seems to be quite an emotive topic, really. Um, data centers connected to the to the grid um, it shouldn't be ignored yeah just to not to reiterate all your points but the fantastic job that actually has gone on here in Ireland over the last number of years from a, a grid development and operation perspective you know air grid are operating the grid now in, in such a way that is the the envy of many grids around the around the world not not just from the integration of renewables perspective but but actually from the I suppose the the power quality perspective actually um if you look at if you look at data center design if you look at pharmaceutical plant design they're they're essentially cookie cutters from from other markets mostly mostly the the us market where you know the reason they've built all that resiliency in in the first place is because their local grids aren't aren't reliable so so we ended up with a lot of stranded capital um assets that are put in that are just a you know a, a probably a hangover from design decisions made made elsewhere but our, our our grid isn't like that our grid is it has a high power quality aspect to it and a massive integration of, of renewables but you know it's 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 it wasn't always i suppose um the way it is now it's, it's a very complex system and it, it's just getting more and, and more complex the de decentralization is here you know the, the idea that the way the power systems used to work and that that's that's essentially gone there there's there's distributed energy and um, generators and and resources such as storage popping up popping up in all sorts of places around the grid i think that's a an important thing just to, to, to keep in mind the grid design and operation used to be very simple you know energy generated centrally 
That's what I was just going to ask. Could you, you know, maybe maybe for some of the audience who may be not overly familiar with how a, a 1900 to 2020 uh, grid worked, um, and what we it, it frames it nicely for what we're going to see as we go forward. So this isn't obviously unique to Ireland, I guess. It's something that we we had as the de facto way of providing electricity to people in their homes was a certain design. Just just maybe if you could just say what we had and what we're evolving to, I think that would frame then very nicely into every connected device has a role to play, including data centers, which is a lovely link then to Tom. I think that would be great if you could do that, please. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, yeah, uh, um, without getting too technical on it, the you know energy generated centrally transmitted to where the load is and then consumed, simple monopolistic system owned and operated with with ESB doing all of that. Um, the first thing really that we looked to do in in the Irish grid was to deregulate to to try and you know work on the on the the cost or the price aspect. We felt that that can bring in competition in the into the market was a was a good thing that started around the year 2000, probably got it done in earnest in, in, in 2011, took quite a, quite a number of years. Um, from the perspective of, of renewables um, integration, you know, the, the first wind farm was, was in, over in Bellacoric Mayo and I think it was 1992. Uh, and, you know, that was a fantastic achievement by uh, Borden Mona at the time, but actually we didn't see any, any major renewable integration into the grid and therefore complexity until probably the early 2000s about 2003 onwards you mm. know we started to see the 100 plus megawatt per year roughly uh, coming onto the grid and it's been a, a slow creep since then um, probably up until around 20, 2011 2012 13 when we started to maybe experience some some proper disruption in the grid from a a frequency perspective, you know, all those renewables coming onto the grid, causing issues with, with frequency, essentially, you know, pouring cold water into an already lukewarm bath doesn't do it any favors. Well, similar, similar sort of thing with, 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 uh, with electricity. And, and from then on, we started to see um, early, early demand response. Demand response was a, was a concept going on in, in the US already uh, because of their, of their grid issues. Um, but we, we started to see some early projects in and around that same that same time. And, and actually, it was around that same 2013, 2014 window that, you know, data centers started to, to really feature in the in the landscape of the grid. And, and some of those 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 early centers got involved with the grid at that at that point to provide some of those uh, demand response uh, services. So. Maybe just to, to, to bookend what you said, just to, to bring it up to, to today, I think if we, if, we th if we just look at that 2013, 14 sort of window of what the grid thought the consumption was going to be today, you know, there's probably not a massive difference. You know, there's probably only about, it's probably only about two, you know, two, two, 220 ish megawatts additional on the grid that the median view that AirGrid had on the had at the time. So, but that's a maybe a bookend of 2020 picture. Now, yeah, a lot of the you, you asked you asked me at the start, what well, you know, why is it maybe such an emotive topic? I think people are concerned and afraid of what's going to happen. What's sure. coming? Because sure. there's, a, there's, a, there's a massive divergence in the in the lines now once we go past a hundred percent and thank you so much for that peter but i think sometimes we go down into a, such a negative spiral of things that are not possible that we need to reflect and it gets lost the fact that in 2013 over an annualized basis on the grid we had in, in the region of 16 percent renewable energy over a year and in 2021 we'd 43 percent of the electrons going into everybody's home, buildings, data centers, was renewable over that year. And, you know, that somehow has been lost. But it just gives us a sense that the only target that was met was the grid, and that's EPA. And it's something that should be acknowledged. It's something that gives engineers, I know, a lot of sort of, wow, we're on momentum here, whereas they're also getting beaten up, whereas they've done some great work over the last 20 years. 
amazing work for all the things that you've said. But I think then it leads nicely into Tom. Tom, thank you um, for joining us this morning uh, in your capacity as uh, Chief Operating Officer with Digital Realty Interaction in Ireland. Um, what I really like about you joining us is the fact that you have seen the data center industry evolve, not just from where you are now, but you've also been part of the growing, and this word people throw out all the time without really possibly knowing what they are, the hyperscale side of things. Um, to think that a 40 megawatt data center isn't a hyperscale is quite something in, in 2021. So thank you for joining us. I'd really be interested in seeing, you have a lovely international dimension as well. Uh, the context, you, you're just recently back from Germany. Um, and I think this is also an important point is that two of the pillars in the world right now is de digitalization and decarbonization. And the speed by which we're doing this is not just for Ireland, it's right across the planet. So I'd love to get your insights into some of those things. Um, and thank you again for joining us. Yeah, and thanks, Gary. And uh, thanks to Engineers Ireland. And welcome to everybody who got up early to listen to uh, a bunch of us rabbit on. Uh, appreciate it. Um, you know, as Gary mentioned, I've, I've quite a bit of experience across the data center industry for the last number of years, uh, growing with both hyperscalers and, you know, smaller scale operators. Um, I think it's important to contextualize exactly what a data center is for a conversation like this. Um, you know, a data center in, in, its, in, its, uh, in itself is, is a core piece of infrastructure to enable a technology rich uh, sector or economy. You know, we underpin a huge amount of businesses and a huge amount of um, technology companies. I mean, everybody will know from your streaming services to your online services, your your no your Facebooks, your Twitters, your Instagrams, your YouTubes, your gaming sectors, Google's, Amazon's, all of that retail stuff, all of that doesn't exist without a data, data center. And you know, it's important when we talk about data centers, and I'm obviously a, an exponent of the data center business being an operator. Um, it's important when we talk about to understand exactly what we do. Um, as Gary mentioned, you know, we, we talked about this decarbonization piece from a data center and, and energy efficiency is really what it comes down to. This is not a new concept in data centers. We've been doing this for, for a number of years. Um, ourselves with interaction and digital realty, we set up our own internal uh, energy efficiency uh, division all the way back in 2009, 2010. And that division has been constantly looking at ways for, for us to evolve our technology and evolve our efficiency when it comes to not just energy usage, but water usage, um, you know, any, any technology or draw that we take out of, the, out of the, the, uh, the infrastructure that we have around us. And we've moved our designs along that and we've evolved our designs. And I'd like to kind of think that data centers and data center operators, particularly the hyperscalers and ourselves, uh, have been a real uh, champion for driving renewables and renewable technologies. Having said that, we realize, you know, we, we do have a big part to play in this. And obviously the headlines recently and the headlines in the last number of months and years have been all about data centers being a huge draw on, on, our, on our grid and our capacity. And we don't shy away from that. We never say, we never, you know, say we're not. We, we acknowledge the fact that we are and we acknowledge that we have a role to play. Um, ourselves, just to give you an example, uh, Interaction Digital Realty, we're a relatively small player in the Irish market a large player on a global scale you know but in the irish market 100 percent of the energy that we pull out of the grid is, is sourced from renewable sources and that has always been our goal and our target um, we look for opportunity to lean into renewable energy sources we are very very lucky in an irish market that we have those available resources not so lucky in other economies where you know that's just not available if you look at the u.s market for example you know if you look across the entirety of data center operators, less than 50% are, are sourced from renewables. And that's really because that energy uh, is not available over there. We're, we're lucky that the energy is available here and we're able to source from that. But what we want to do is take that a step further. And as I said, we're constantly evolving our design. We're looking for new ways to, uh, you know, to source, new ways to generate on site, new ways to uh, scale our designs and, and evolve our designs. And, Niall will go into a little bit more about that, you know, having his experience in the commissioning sector. Um, if you look at the data compared to power, the evolution of that over, you know, the last 10 years, and Gary has some great figures on this, it's not exponential. They, they don't run in parallel. 
we are pulling far more data and generating far more data now per megawatt usage than we were back in you know, 2010, 2012, when the, the data center industry really kicked off. And that evolution is, is a real uh, indicator for the data center industry of how far we've come. And, and, you know, that doesn't get talked about enough, I don't think. You know, we don't see that those figures on paper. I think, I think you're spot on there, Tom. Um, I think that uh, uh, just the point I think you're mentioning, and, and I'm sure, Peter, the International Energy Association's numbers as a term of reference is reasonably credible. Um, uh, the International Energy Association would publish it every six months, digitization and decarbonization report, a guy called George Kamaya, if you want to check it out, it's a really good in-depth analysis of the dematerialization of the world, the de decarbonization and the digitalization. And what he has demonstrated is, it's hard to believe for those that are, are, are not in the industry, is that we've seen a 12 and a half times increase in the amount of data in the world in the past 10 years. We've seen a 0.6% increase in the electricity consumption globally to support that. Why is that? And Tom, I'd ask you this question. Um, why is that is because two things. You're, you are effectively like Dundrum Shopping Centre in one respect. You're consolidating an awful lot of other retail, individual small pockets of retail into a centralised location. You know, mm -hmm. you're taking off on-premise, as it used to be called, right. into... So, I mean, that's often forgotten about. You've seen that, I'm thinking, both in your role with... Yeah with Interaction now, and also the cloud. I mean, cloud first for startups in your previous mm -hmm. role. You know, can you just talk to us about that, that evolving, changing dynamic of where, when somebody clicks, their data is? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> we forget that date, there's two words in data center, right? Data yeah. and a center. Sorry, yeah. for, sorry for putting my middle finger up there. It wasn't <laughs> in any way intentional. <laughs> But don't, but don't you absolutely know that's what's going to be going out on Twitter? <laughs> yeah, th there you go. That's, that's the tagline for this. That's the tagline, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, yeah. You know, that's a, that's a really good point. If you look at the evolution of data centers, where we are now compared to where we were again 10 years ago, I mean, a data center 10 years ago, and, and in some cases still today, was exactly that, was an on-prem IT room in a bank or a retailer or a, an infrastructure company or a, a technology company, a room never designed to be a data center to house the volume of servers uh, and, and all of the, the, the outputs that they generate. So, you know, it, these were often squeezed into office blocks and office buildings, um, often manipulated uh, power systems made up from, you know, power systems that were never designed to take that specific load, cooling systems that were never designed to cool that infrastructure. And data centers really started to take all of that infrastructure that was never designed to be in that location and, and was growing way too fast for anybody to keep track of. Yeah. And we took all of that and put it into purpose-built temperature and humidity controlled, environmentally controlled, centralized data centers. Um, and by doing that, it enabled us to get it economies of scale across cooling, across power usage, across environmental controls. And by doing that, we reduced that, exactly that, that data to power ratio. We, we brought that down very, very significantly. And that migration, as you said, Gary, as well, to the cloud. I mean, if you look across globally, across global platforms, less than 20% of global businesses have migrated to the cloud. That, mm. that's the, that means we have 80% of industry and businesses that still have to migrate. Yeah. And by doing that, it allows us to, again, you know, leverage economies of scale. By compressing that data, we've built far more efficient servers. We've got uh, much more dense data storage. We've got better cooling systems. We've got much more regulated power usage. And all of that reduces that data to power, data to water usage, data to cooling, data to facilities and services ratios. Um, and that really is where, where it is. I mean, when you... Log on to Gary's point. I mean, you, when you go onto your Netflix or your um, Amazon Web Services and, and buy Christmas presents, you know that all of that information is routed through 
specific data centers. And there's reasons why it's there. There's, you know, there's reasons why, you know, our sectors like our banking sectors, our IT sectors rely on data centers, because not only do we house the data in a much more environmentally friendly and efficient manner, we also provide resiliency and redundancy for all of that data. So it's never lost. So, to, you know, a great example is, you know, you, you, your data will never reside in one data center, it will reside in two, possibly three, maybe more, maybe separate regions. And, and, that's, and we'll certainly come back to that point that uh, you're avoiding the cleaning man on a Friday plugging out the server to the put, server. It, put, put it in the Uber. But I think also just to give some of the listeners some context, there's, there's a, a content, reasonably contentious contract being reissued in the United States for the American Department of Defense. Um, and it is a, basically a cloud-based contract to replace 10,000 data centers throughout the United States for the American Department of Defense into the cloud. 10,000 <laughs> data centers. And that's why the IEA, these people are saying, look, you can't just say, say in context of that's what they are. It's not incremental. It's replacing so many other bits. So, Niall, thank you for being so patient there. And listen, okay. and 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 um, you're sort of the Luke O'Neill of this uh, panel. You know, you're you're sort of the the engineer with uh, uh, the knowledge that can. You've seen this industry, right? You've been yep. part of this industry, and there's a great sense, isn't there, uh, in certain parties that these these centres just suck in electricity the same level as they did 15, 20 years ago, which of course is not the same. Same way as your car today is a very different animal to the Capri I had in 1986, you know? Um, can you just, you, you, you basically are a commissioning agent. Yes, you go yes. in to the center of these data centers and you bring together all the bits and bobs and you make it more efficient. That's your yeah, job. Absolutely, yeah. And, and before um, I go into my boring stuff, just a little statistic for you guys to be aware of. And this leans on what, what Tom has been saying. For every one kilowatt of power consumed by a data center, the industry says that that saves 10 kilowatts of power in the broader community. So that's a, that's a very powerful multiplier effect. In for, so data centers are really helping society in general. But um, so just, I suppose, before I get into the other boring stuff, most people don't know what commissioning is just as an FYI. So our job is to help Tom and other operators to ensure the quality of their deliverable is achieved. So they want a good building. Anybody wants a good building which operates efficiently and effectively. And our role in the industry is to help them achieve that. Um, we've been talking about you know, the progression of of, this, of the industry over the last number of years. When we first uh, got into the business, um, we were seeing really, I suppose, old school infrastructure, a bit like Peter described earlier in the conversation. These uh, designs were created elsewhere, but being used in the Irish economy and the broader European economy. Uh, in that space of time, like we've seen the raw equipment count drop by about 10, 12%. So basically you're, you're able to achieve the same output for a smaller carbon footprint of equipment being deployed. So there's, there's that level of efficiency. Mm. Um, we've also seen a major shift in the Climate, climatic conditions within the data centers themselves. So again, in the, we'll say mid 2010s, it wouldn't be unusual for a data center, even in Ireland, to be run at something like 22 degrees, 23 degrees C. We've now seen that those centers are running at more like 27 degrees C. So that small temperature differential is very powerful because for every one degree of temperature increase, you save between two and 3% power in terms of cooling. Mm. 
And that's even in a situation where you're looking at a, you know, a, a friendly climate like you have in Ireland, okay, where we try to use as much free cooling as possible. Could you explain that slightly to, to the listeners? Um, we hear a lot about, about uh, temperate climate and uh, free air cooling. In, in simplistic terms, sucking in the stuff from outside and letting it run through the aisles. Is that it in, in a nutshell? Yeah, in, in, a simple, in its simplest way, that's exactly what it is. You, versus drawing... what? Could you just compare that to what? So if you, were, if you were in a very hot climate, okay, you'd have to bring in the, or at least you want to bring in outside air, as well as mix the air within the building itself. So for example, if you were in a desert climate and you were drawing in outside air, you have to condition that air as it comes into your facility. Otherwise you'll end up cooking your servers and mm. you don't really want to cook server mm. as everyone wants to be able to watch their Netflix or whatever it might be. Mm. But in the Irish climate, it's, it's conducive to what you call free cooling or mm you know, I, I suppose a level up on that, it would be adiabatic cooling, where you're using uh, spraying or misting water into the cooling mechanisms in order to use physics to its best, best benefit, basically. Um, so that what that does, that ultimately is not unique to Ireland. It's a no, temperate, no. temperate no, no. climate. A temperate climate gives us that, but it's yeah. one of, it's one of the... Uh, effectively, that whole gig is just to reduce the amount of energy, electricity yep, yep. that you use to um, process the air to a temperature that can cool down your racks. So exactly. you're over. Okay. Ex okay. Exactly. Exactly. So when when you look at then the other aspects that Tom has mentioned, and I think I hear a lot now, and it should be right and it's proper for society that rather than just going deep and narrow on one aspect of data centers, electricity we should be more mindful of the climate neutral aspects of it. And that's not just obviously in a consumption basis. It's a, what can we do with that waste heat if society has a way of using it? Where is that discussion with your clients at the moment? So we're seeing our clients um, drive towards like some of them have a very aggressive targets that are in line with you know the latest cop 26 so a, a whole decarbonization and net zero goal by 2030 uh, there are other um, groups in the, the industry who have slightly less aggressive targets um, we're seeing like it, it was in the press very recently about you know amazon in tala with their uh, approach to district heating within the community um, We've seen other, other clients use similar approaches in other parts of the world. Um, it's probably been a little bit less taken up in, in Ireland because of our slightly more temperate climate, really. Like we would have seen in, we'll say, Danish facilities, for example, uh, they were using the excess um, hot air to actually, you know, remove snow during the winter as an, as an opportunity to take pressure off roofs of buildings uh, and prevent collapses or, or something of that nature. So there's many different ways of, of deploying the excess um, outputs from these industries and from these facilities themselves. Um, but, but do, you, do, you not, do you not often think, Niall, that uh, it's sometimes thrown at all industry, not just data centers, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. But you're talking there about a waste heat, a waste. But it has to go somewhere. So unless where it's going is developed or is yeah. planning to be developed, it's it has hard to be able to receive it. So what you've just said, and, and it's a wonderful bit of work that's going on with the Kodima organization in Tala, where they've taken all of the, uh, to listeners, they've taken all the public buildings within a reasonable ratio of uh, one of the data centers out there. The, is it the library, the technology university, the social housing, and South Dublin County Council, um, all within their control. And they've taken the waste heat and integrated it into those from a hyperscale. But the hyperscale always had the waste heat, right? Yeah. So what's different? So what's what's changed? 
<laughs> I'm leading you through a. <laughs> yeah, I, know I, it's, it's the it's the ability of the the broader community to be able to take advantage of that. So, are you seeing? And this is probably the the point is that you're seeing more and more of those center owners yep. building that into their potential. Absolutely. It, as and when society is ready. Yep, Whereas absolutely. you talk about Norway, you talk about Finland, they've been doing district cooling, district heating for over 200 years, some of them. Yeah, <laughs> no. absolutely. It's, it's part and parcel of, of the, the kind of mission statements of a lot of these groups now is to be as community conscious as possible and to embrace the community and and speak to them, you know, as, you know, not only grid, good grid citizens, but good community citizens. So, so we don't, they don't necessarily want, now I don't want to speak for Tom or, or you know, that part of the industry, but, you know, in conversations that, that we're having with our clients, it's, they understand their role, they understand the, their impact on the broader society, and they want to support that broader society to do the things that are, that are good for not only the, the economy, but also the climate and our environment itself. Thank you so much, uh, Niall. That, that, that's great clarity um, from an, an inside a server room <laughs> and an inside a business perspective. Peter, can I ask you to join us once more for, for um, um, a couple of questions that are myth-busting, I guess. And, you know, in this discussion so far, and even the questions coming in, there's an awful lot of polarization. There's an awful lot of toxic discussions around asset classes like data centers. And they've been connected with an awful lot of stuff that actually is, it's great clickbait, but maybe it's just downright not true. And I'd love if you could just help us understand how a grid works in terms of these famous blackouts and amber alerts and all this type of stuff that a growing society, um, you know, we see headlines, blackouts, data centers. And, and, and usually that's where people read. They don't read between the lines and read in then to the, the rest. How does a grid work, Peter? How does a grid actually, in a modern society, we've talked about the achievements at 43%, We've talked about the migration to a, a more smart grid, but large energy users like wafer fabs or, or, or uh, pharmaceuticals or data centers or aluminium plants, they have built in redundancy, resilience. And the grid, you know, can we just tell some of the, 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 the people listening, you don't go from everything working to everybody in a blackout. The grid has to have some sort of contingency. And why do you think, Peter, as a person who understands this, is it an easy target to say data centers are responsible for blackouts? Oh, Gary, that's a, that's a lot of questions you've just thrown at me. In one just tell us how the grid works. Tell us how the grid works. So, <laughs> um, this, is, this is one of the contentious things. We go from lights on to lights out, and guess what? Let's blame data centers. Tell us how a grid works, if you wouldn't mind, please. Yeah, um, I suppose where, where to start? To start with... Um, it takes a lot of planning. It takes really good planning. Um, essentially how it works is real-time balancing of, of, uh, of generation versus the, the demand curve. The demand curve is generally figured out a day ahead of, 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 um, of, of what's going to be there. But then there's all sorts of checks and balances that are, that are done right up until the moment of delivery. So it's, 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 a, it's a fantastic balancing uh, effort. Um, I suppose again, just to jump back onto an, the earlier point that I made to to stop it today or in 2020, um, er, everything's been kind of on plan, but what's what's coming is not necessarily on on the same plan. The the growth within this particular sector definitely wasn't known, but you know, 10, 10 years ago. However, the, there's a massive opportunity with this because. The thing about the thing about this type of load is that it's predictable and it's pretty flat. 
So from a, a grid planning perspective, this load represents a massive opportunity. Um, the, the recent increase of, of, of 10% onto our renewables targets for, for 2030 is, 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 a, is a massive engineering challenge that we're, we're gonna to need to figure out. And the, the, the silver bullet for renewable integration really is, is storage and, and the, the opportunities that storage gives, um, uh, time of day opportunities, but also power quality um, opportunities. And, and actually, when we, if we think about it from a, an economic standpoint and, and actually an embedded carbon standpoint, data centers are gonna invest in the types of equipment that the grid needs access to from, from time to time, back to this concept of, of demand response, being, being there for when the, the grid needs it. The grid is, the grid is perfectly capable of, of balancing itself. You know, only, only this week um, with, with data center uh, participation, I might add, there was the guts of an 800 megawatt uh, reduction off the grid, where, where two two of the major plants were, um, were 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 under fault. So, you know, we we had um, Whitegate and, and Dublin Bay. So the grid was able to manage manage that, and, and data centers played a, played a part in that. And, can and I that's, just that's another can, concern. Can I just ask you there, Peter, for one second? Because we throw out numbers as if everybody understands what they are. To give some context to that, the grid is about five thousand megawatts. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, r r in and around, right? So the grid is functioning at 5,000 megawatts. You're saying we lost because of, for whatever reason, 800 of that, which is equivalent of nearly 17, 18%. It, it was, yeah, it was about, okay. about 20% at the time. About, about 20%. Yeah. And again, it leads me, and I'm sorry to push you a little bit on it, but um, ultimately what a grid is built to do is to have the ability to make sure that hospitals and homes and all these people are the last people to lose electrons going through their wire. Yeah. So whether you're a data center, whether you're a wafer fab, whether you're a, a cement maker, you have basically a contract with the grid operator that you, you're the first dude that's asked to reduce your usage. You could be the last guy if it all came to it to be asked to disconnect. Is that fact, fiction, or I'm trying to get to the stage, Peter, without having any hat on here, whether I'm a wafer fab guy or a data center guy, to explain the fact that, you know, data centers are gone. Wafer fabs are gone when it gets to the stage of disconnecting citizens' houses. Fact, not fact. Facts that the, the 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 grid's job is to is to ultimately keep the lights on in the most important municipal buildings, such as you know hospitals and so on. Absolutely, they they will be the the last people that the grid will try and and, and protect. The reality the reality of those guys losing power is pretty low. Like the rolling blackouts thing, um, is in my in my opinion. Uh, just to be clear, in my opinion, uh, a media whipped up um, piece of, of commentary. Yes, we have we have you know issues with um, congestion and constraint within the the Dublin network, and yes, it is because of a lot of development. However, these 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 issues are are all part and parcel of operating a normal grid. This is this is business pretty much business as you as usual. Yeah, no, I, I, I f fully appreciative uh, of that answer that you're giving. Um, Pete, uh, Tom, so you've looked at this type of thing of, of um, and uh, Niall, you used the term there, we need to all become smart grid citizens. Whether you're at home with your prosumer model, whether you're a data center. And as P Peter has just explained, um, you get requests all the time, I guess, even in your current capacity. Could you help us out? Will you help us out before you're told you've no choice? You're going to help us out. 
Um, there's, this, there's, a, there's a general feeling around the place as data centers are, are, are so arrogant that they'll run and run and run irrespective of their responsibility to the grid. What's your answer to that? I, well, that's not true. I mean, one doesn't exist without the other. Um, you know, and, and what we find in the data center industry in particular is that regardless of what the data center operator would like to do, we have, we're being driven a lot by our customers and our customers' demands for for this type of a service and this and this type of a renewable commitment so you're, you're exactly right i mean it's not a new concept for data centers to uh to operate a flexible uh you know flexible power draw at peak times i mean that's happened for a number of years even in ireland and across other metros uh you know we see it in countries like you know south africa for example where we have data centers down in in uh, cape town you know where they have a very very uh, inefficient grid system, you know, and regularly we data centers will drop off the grid and run on their own generated power for extended periods of time, while that grid capacity is diverted elsewhere. That's not a new, <clears throat> it's not a new concept. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think we're, you know, going back to our efficiencies are really uh, are gained in our design. Um, you know, as Niall mentioned, you know, the evolution of that design, not just from free cooling and, and, and power uses and efficiencies and more dense servers. Uh, where we can store more data with, with less power. That, that's where we really gain our efficiencies. Um, yeah. What a data center has to, has to provide is resiliency, uptime, and continuation of service to its customers and clients. And we will look at all factors when it comes to that. We, 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 we as much as anybody else on the network, um, need to provide that you know, con continuity of service. Um, but we're very conscious of where we take that power from. We're very conscious of where we take our water from, our renewables from. And we have we realize as a data center operator, not just ourselves, but the hyperscalers and all data centers in this business, we realize we play a significant part in it. And you know, we we take the necessary measures to do that. And it's often it's often discussed, and I suppose it's a point that you're making, is that was data that resides in these centers is the oxygen of the industrial revolution 4.0 and no asset class has ever been so important. You know, the speed by which data has consumed our lives and everything we do has probably never been seen at a societal level ever. And yet the asset class of a data center is probably only two decades old. If that, if that. Yeah. yeah. So there are just growing pains of society, one would suggest, on grids and decarbonization, and also this acceleration of digitization. Niall, I have to tell you that I'm not sure if the audience have been listening to myself, Peter, and Tom at all, because the questions that are coming in are all regarding your uh, input, and mainly to the point that people really want to see this term of reference that you've got for the 1K versus 10K. The American Institute of uh, Engineers, I think it was, but maybe maybe uh, uh, we can we can dig that out and forward it to the engineers to to show that metric. Yeah, absolutely. I've just actually responded to a couple of the questions there. Have you? And, and you provided, drop it in there. Please. I just provided the the link. The the well the the comment anyway, but I will dig out the link as well. So, yeah, so. yeah. The other thing that we haven't discussed, uh, um, and I guess it's it's just to remind people is that there's two words in data center, one's data and the other center. So when we look at smart grids, and we, I just got one here in my house the other day, and it's telling me that this grid, this smart meter will reduce my energy consumption in my house by 30%. It's only smart for one reason, data. So should I be able to offset one against the other? I'm not sure. But that when you permeate that out throughout society, smart meters, smart cities, smart municipalities, so let's have a look at some of these questions. We have five minutes, so it's going to be rapid fire, okay? Um, because you've you've, you've uh, oh, there's loads in chat. Sorry, guys, I'm only looking at the Q and A. So if you want your question, chat is not where you should be, right? Um, let's have a look at this. Great discussion, blah blah. What are the panels said? Uh, how much data is there sitting in the cloud? Never assessed. Yeah, great question there. Um, you know, and again. We're entering an era, aren't we, Tom, where we can build, design, and operate data centers fit for purpose, mm -hmm. you know, fit for purpose. There was a time we built big sheds in one location, and you had to right. store your data then. Correct. The other thing is, Tom, not all data is the same. 
cats running up curtains can be sent up to the Nordics or other geographic locations. And that's called glacial data, right? Correct. And, you know, we can put that data where in, in, in any location really access. I mean, any, you, there's a couple of things when you're looking at data. One is the retrieving rates. So your latency issues about how close you need to be to that point of data. So your fiber speeds and your fiber uh, uh, distances have an impact on that. Longer term storage of data is, is a big thing. So as we see a move from people, you know, moving, moving their own personal stuff online, photographs, life memorabilia, uh, long records, uh, you know, from banking sites, from all different sectors, some of that data will not be retrieved or not need to be retrieved. So we can put that in a different location. We can also put it in a different medium. So if you think in data center terms, you know, we're, we're evolving the likes of a server and to terabytes worth of data on a server now that used to hold maybe, yeah. you know, a couple of gigs. Yeah. Um, that now we've gone back to some old technologies in certain places where we've gone to tape storage because tape storage doesn't require humidity, temperature controls. We can store that in a normal environment. So we're storing longer term data there. There's really smart data storage solutions coming out. DNA yeah. storage is the one that, I, that one I've been yeah. following where we yeah. can decode strands of DNA with data and house it in a, in a place that doesn't require the same temperature, humidity or power uh, dense uh, facilities to store it. So and all of that evolution in long-term storage and data has been actively pursued by the market, I would say, in data centers. And I guess a lot of people, you know, the whole concept of a data center, when they look at the outside of it, is, is, is very large uh, a structure that takes electricity. But really all it is, is if one wants to think of it, it's like Sandyford when Microsoft used to put billions of floppy disks in 40-foot containers and ship them to Duisburg. That's just a conversion. Right. The conversion ratio is just that they don't longer ship floppy disks so the warehouse and microsoft and sandyford is closed they just mm -hmm. moved that to grange castle the other thing that i think is really interesting is the the whole concept of changing technologies you know this little baby in my hand here is a 256 gigabyte device that uses a quarter of the electricity that the first iphone did with four gigabytes Mm -hmm. And it's a great parallel because more people understand what this lad does than a data center, but that's a data center, an extension. That's the edge for most of the people who are into this. That's an edge device. <laughs> right, and this right. is what we need to do. And I, I, I thank you for your input on that. We have one more question and one minute. And I'm going to pick the hardest question I can. Um, and the most contentious one, because Peter, Peter's a great man for taking on the big, the big questions, right? So Peter. One. <laughs> show the show the delegates your shorts. That's what I'd like everybody to see. Because you you are the best man for shorts. Have the panelists um seen a move towards utilizing stranded assets, generators, UPSs. Again, you called it storage, I guess, grid citizenship, smart grid citizenship. Um, and again, I I'd like the panel's view on our other asset classes like wafer fabs, pharmaceuticals and other assets also doing this because ultimately it's a it's everybody's game to play. Peter, are you starting to see discussions? Is that called demand response in your world? Yeah, it, it's, it's and it's it's not that it's all hot now, but it's um it's it's getting more evolved. The, 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 the initial way that it used to be done, you know, just simply coming off coming off the grid and going on to your backup um, for two hour periods and um, traditional all capacity market involvement um, is it, definitely evolving. The, the, the CRU consultation this week is a, a formalization of the, the, the evolution of demand response as a concept in, in real simple terms. Um, uh, personally, there's an, there's, it raises a ton of questions, you know, and we work in that space of helping people to answer, answer these questions. There are many, many operational questions that, that this new guidance uh, uh, posts. And really what, what that guidance was, was just a formalization of what the industry had been told informally in many, many meetings that have been going on for the last year, year and a half or so. Isn't that the best thing about the evolution is that eventually you get to certainty? Yeah, I, 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 it's fantastic news, Gary, you know, you know, agree. Like Tom, are you know they're really agree. going to be pushed and they're going to struggle now over the next couple of years to figure this out. But actually, 
for Ireland Inc. and the Glo the World Inc. This is a, a fantastic move that's been made, but it's a massive technical challenge for data center operators now to wrap their heads around, and they're going to need a lot of help. So, I, I guess I get I guess I I I I'm a data guy, not a center guy. So to me, this is just the evolution of the floppy disk. And when I look back to the massive challenge of 20 years ago to digitize the world and to think that today we've got 5 billion people, 5 billion people of the seven connected. That was a massive challenge, but we got there. Now it's a matter of changing that dial again. Niall, inside it, you've got 60 seconds. Are you seeing technical challenges that are unsurmountable of releasing some of these UPSs and bits to help the grid become more smart? No, no? we're actually seeing the UPSs be being used today. So let me just stop that for a second. You are seeing the UPSs being used today. So in real terms, layman, all these BESS things that are being built, BESS being battery storage on the grid to help all these things I don't understand. UPS is effectively our big versions of that within a data center, right? Yep, they, like right. for a data center, they help obviously stabilize the power supply coming in. Right. So they, they clean the power. So today, without the numbers, there are data centers actively acting as BESS without the grid having to the expense of the capital spend and the delays and all that type of stuff. Yes yep. or no? Yes. Okay. So these are good discussions because they're, we're trying to dispel some of the myths that people carry around. That to, And I leave this last comment to Tom, that the arrogance of the data center industry is you just keep building and you just keep expecting. Yeah. And I think through this process that what Peter is saying is that now at least we have a statement of intent that we all have to align with. And I'll go back to the three documents area earlier our climate action plan fed into by the air grid plan and then within that the cru direction and connections i'll leave the question to you are you optimistic about sort of that just what's come out is validated the direction and the path we're already taken or the or is it hit you like a brick wall no we're, we're absolutely the, the former uh, in fairness, everything that's come out from the CRU, um, everything that's been written into legislation now has, is, is not new to us. As I mentioned, we've, we've been looking at uh, efficiencies in design for well over 10 years uh, and more with data centers. So we're actually happy uh, as a data center operator. We realize there's challenges to, to, to be faced, but we relish the challenge and we've always relished the challenge. And uh, you know, as, as the guys have said, we've been doing a lot of this probably in the background and unnoticed for a period of time. So this is just uh, a continuation of what we've been doing for a number of years. And we're looking forward to uh, increasing that and taking the challenge head on. Okay. Thank you, Niall. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Peter. Uh so, so listen, Gary, thank you for moderating. That was excellent. I think, um, I think you could keep that going probably all morning. Um, some very, very interesting discussion, very balanced, which is important. Um, and very, very interesting. So thank you very much for that. And thank you to all the panelists, Peter, Tom and Niall, um, excellent speakers. And thanks for jumping in on the live questions. That was great too, because there's loads of questions coming in and the guys were jumping in on that as we, as we went through the webinar. So thanks for that. Um, thanks to everyone who has joined this morning. We had great numbers. We, I think we peaked around 92 at, the, at one stage and nearly to the end, um, which is very important. Um, thanks for that. And again, thanks to Kean O'Sullivan, who's the secretary for the PM Society for Engineers Ireland.